Many Nobel Prizes in physics are awarded for significant fundamental discoveries that significantly expand our understanding of the universe. Unfortunately, today, these boundaries are already quite widely expanded, so much so that it is sometimes very difficult to understand what exactly and how precisely the Nobel laureates discovered. Nevertheless, sometimes the most prestigious scientific award is given to very practical discoveries. And that's exactly what happened in 2018, when the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to Arthur Ashkin, Gerard Maru, and Donna Strickland for their ingenious inventions in the field of laser technology, which gave humanity access to fundamentally new technologies, such as optical tweezers and high-precision laser scalpels, enabling biologists and medical professionals to perform surgical operations even on individual cells. Moreover, the physical principles underlying these technologies are simple enough to explain without complex formulas and in understandable language. That's precisely what we're going to do today. More precisely, Arthur Ashkin developed optical tweezer technology, which allows for the precise manipulation of microscopic objects. An optical tweezer can capture individual cells or even parts of cells, and sometimes individual molecules like large proteins. In the simplest case, an optical tweezer represents just a laser beam with a special beam structure, where the light intensity increases as it approaches the center and decreases towards the edges. Such beams in optics are called Gaussian. To understand how it works, let's consider a small transparent spherical object placed near the axis of this beam, but not on the axis itself. Light from the laser passing through the object will undergo asymmetric refraction. If the object is below the center of the beam, rays of higher intensity will exit from the bottom part of the object compared to the top. Photons of light possess momentum, and due to the asymmetry of refraction, the light passing through the object will carry momentum, with more momentum carried downwards than upwards. Consequently, according to the law of conservation of momentum, the object itself will acquire momentum directed upwards. If the object is placed above the center of the beam, it will be pushed downwards. In simpler terms, when placed in the laser beam, the object seems to be attracted towards the center of the beam. So, if we slowly move the beam, it will seem to pull the object along. The laser beam will work like a sort of tweezer. However, there is still another problem. The radiation pressure of the beam will push the object away from the source, so precise grasping won't be possible. However, this problem can be solved by passing the beam through a lens with a focal length, such that the beam is focused at a specific point inside the object. To understand what will happen to the object in this case, let's break down the incoming and outgoing beam's momenta into projections along the coordinate axes. It's easy to understand that the horizontal projection of the momentum of the converging outgoing beam will be less than the horizontal projection of the momentum of the beam after passing through the object. Therefore, thanks to the same law of conservation of momentum, the object will acquire momentum directed towards the light source thus starting to be attracted towards the light source. If the parameters of the system are chosen correctly, a balance can be achieved between such optical attraction and the repulsion caused by the pressure of the laser beam on the surface of the object, thereby stabilizing it in the beam. This thing is very similar to a capture beam, which is often applied in science fiction works. Yes, this fantastic technology is not so fantastic after all. Although, of course, it doesn't work exactly like in Star Wars if only because the forces acting on the bodies from the optical tweezer usually amount to billionths of a newton. That's how, or approximately how, the first optical tweezers constructed by Ashkin and his colleagues in the late 1980s worked. Today, we have learned to create more advanced devices using more complex geometries of laser beams. Such devices allow us to work even with opaque and reflective objects, and the use of beams with circular polarization allows us not only to fix or move microscopic objects, but also, for example, to rotate them around their axis. Control of the polarization of light beams is a terribly interesting and very important topic, but it will require a somewhat deeper dive into wave optics than I would like to limit myself to in this video. However, in the near future, I plan to release several specialized videos on wave optics in which we will talk about both light polarization and how light propagates in matter in general, 
and why, for example, there is such a thing as the refractive index. So don't forget to subscribe to the channel to make sure you don't miss anything interesting. Now let's move on to the second part of the 2018 Nobel Prize the part awarded to Gerard Mouru and Donna Strickland for the discovery of what is called chirped pulse amplification. This is a technology that allows for the generation of ultra-powerful and ultra-short laser pulses necessary for solving many tasks, including the ability to create highly precise laser scalpels, which can be used, for example, in ophthalmic surgeries. To understand what we're talking about, we first need to remind ourselves of how a laser works. We have a detailed video about it on our channel, so we won't delve into that now, but rather just remind you of the basic principles of laser operation. If we take an atom of a substance and somehow give it a certain amount of energy, the atom will enter an excited state and then return to its ground state after some time, releasing the previously absorbed energy in the form of a photon, which is an elementary unit of electromagnetic radiation of a specific wavelength. We cannot predict in advance how long a particular atom will stay in the excited state or in which direction it will emit the photon. So, if we somehow supply energy to a medium consisting of many atoms, they will emit light one after another in various directions. This is what happens, for example, in gas discharge lamps or LEDs. However, it turns out that if a photon with exactly the same wavelength as the one the excited atom is ready to emit passes by, the emission of the photon will occur immediately and in the same direction as the first photon. This process is called stimulated emission. The principle of laser operation is based on this effect. We take a certain substance, also called the active medium, supply it with energy, thereby converting some of its atoms into the excited state. This process is also called pumping. Then we pass a photon through the medium, which initiates the process of stimulated emission, causing the medium to release the accumulated energy, thus effectively cloning the initial photon. As a result, we get a powerful and narrowly directed beam of light, what is called a laser beam. Obviously, the power of the laser beam will be determined by the power of the energy source through which we pump the active medium. In simple lasers, which you can buy on AliExpress, we are talking about powers in hundredths, at most tenths of a watt. And the power sources providing the corresponding pumping intensity can be small enough to fit in your pocket. If we need more power, say in units or tens of watts, then we will need significantly more massive devices with more powerful energy sources. Lasers with powers in the thousands of watts will be the size of cabinets and weigh hundreds of kilograms. However, physicists needed even more powerful lasers for their special scientific purposes, say, with powers in the millions or even billions of watts, that is, with gigawatt and megawatt powers. It sounds almost insane because to create a laser with even a megawatt of power, you will need an entire power station as an energy source. In fact, even more, because ordinary lasers convert only about a third of the energy they consume into light, the rest goes to heating the installation, so powerful lasers will also need cooling systems, making the installations even more energy intensive, massive, and expensive. However, there is another way. Let's imagine that we can somehow divide the laser beam emitted by a one watt laser over one second into 10 parts, each lasting one tenth of a second, accordingly one tenth of a joule in each. Now let's somehow compress our pulses so that each of them has a duration of one hundredth of a second, turning the continuous beam into a series of pulses. The total energy emitted by the laser will still be one joule. However, it will now be divided into pulses with power of one ten joule and duration of one hundredth of a second, which will give us a power of each pulse of 10 watts. If we compress the beams by another factor of 10 to a duration of one thousandth of a second, we will get a power of 100 watts, and so on. All this with the same power consumed by the laser. The stronger we can compress the pulse, the greater the peak power we will get. All that remains is to understand how exactly we can carry out this procedure. Historically, several methods have been used to do this, and the most successful one turned out to be the method of generating short pulses using signal modulation, i.e. forming a composite signal from several signals with different phases and frequencies. Let's look at our initial laser beam. 
It consists of a wave with a single wavelength and frequency. This means that our beam represents a simple sinusoidal wave where the intensity of the electromagnetic field changes in time and space as a sine function. Now imagine that we added another beam to our beam with twice the frequency. In electrodynamics, there is a principle of superposition, which states that the intensity of the total field is equal to the sum of the intensities of its two component fields. And the shape of our total beam, composed of two beams of different frequencies, will look like this. Now let's add a third beam with a frequency three times higher than the first one, and we'll get this picture. I think you've already noticed, instead of a uniform distribution of energy, we get a fundamentally different picture, where short and powerful peaks stand out at the general level. That is, we have done exactly what we needed. By adding waves of different frequencies, we have transformed continuous radiation into pulsed radiation and the peak power inside the pulse significantly exceeds the average power of the signal. This technology is called mode locking. Using lasers that generate light of different wavelengths and combining them, we obtain short pulses of high power. The shorter the duration of the pulse, the higher the power. Thanks to this, it was possible to create lasers of acceptable size and cost with pulse powers in the millions and even billions of watts. And furthermore, Theoretically, the duration of the pulse could be reduced even further to 10 to the power of minus 12 and even 10 to the power of minus 15 seconds, which would allow us to obtain pulses with a power of terawatts, that is, trillions of watts. However, physicists encountered a problem on the way to solving this task. In super powerful lasers, the final pulse is usually obtained through a series of amplification acts. That is, you take a relatively low power pulse, pass it through the active medium, obtain a more powerful pulse, pass it through the active medium again, and so on, until you reach the required power. However, if you compress the pulse very strongly and achieve a very high peak power, you will encounter a situation where at a certain stage you can no longer amplify your beam. It simply becomes too powerful and will destroy your active zone. This difficulty could be overcome by reducing the energy concentration in the medium. That is, roughly speaking, making your beam wider, which required larger active zone sizes, and so on. That is, we have come back to where we started. In order to create a more powerful laser, you needed to create a larger and more expensive laser. Therefore, after the discovery of mode locking technology in the 1960s, when the peak power of laser pulses jumped from megawatts to gigawatts, Further power increase went slowly for about 25 years, and creating terawatt lasers that did not occupy entire buildings seemed like an unreachable dream. However, in 1985, Gerard Maru and Donna Strickland discovered their chirped pulse amplification technology, which allowed for the creation of relatively compact terawatt lasers and pushed further. Today, we live in the era of pulsed lasers with peak powers already in petawatts, or 10 to the power of 15 watts, which is a million times more than what was available to us before this discovery. The solution turned out to be somewhat paradoxical. Maru and Strickland proposed to do exactly the opposite of what physicists had done before, not to compress laser pulses, but on the contrary, to stretch them. That is, when you get an ultra-short and ultra-powerful pulse, powerful enough to destroy your setup, you stretch it, which leads to a decrease in peak power. Then you feed this stretched and weakened pulse into the active medium, amplify it, and then compress it again, getting what you need, a short pulse of increased power. This can be done thanks to the fact that, as we discussed above, short pulses are not actually monochromatic radiation, like the radiation of a regular laser, but radiation consisting of a certain set of waves of different lengths. And therefore, you can direct this beam to a device that disperses light into a spectrum. It can be, for example, a regular prism that refracts light at different angles. But more often, a diffraction grating is used. How it works is roughly understood by everyone who has ever held a compact disc in their hands. Directing the beam onto a diffraction grating, which disperses it into spectral components, you then direct beams of different colors through a pair of lenses, which refocus them and direct them onto a second grating which again collects the beams into a single bundle. 
However, because beams of different colors, i.e. different wavelengths, have traveled slightly different distances in the system, in the resulting bundle, they will not all travel together, but one after the other. First, longer wavelength waves, then shorter and shorter ones. This means that the overall length of the bundle, i.e. the pulse duration, will increase, while the peak power will decrease. Such a temporally stretched pulse, consisting first of longer and then shorter waves, is called chirped, which is an abbreviation of compressed high-intensity radiation pulse. And now, with such a chirped pulse, we can feed it into our amplifier, which will increase its overall power, and then direct the amplified pulse to another pair of diffraction gratings, eliminate the stretching introduced by the first pair of gratings, and transform the stretched chirped pulse into a regular one, short and powerful. This remarkably elegant and simple solution to a complex problem, in my opinion, fully deserves a Nobel Prize. The discovery of chirped pulse amplification technology, or CPA technology, as I mentioned earlier, has allowed laser technology to reach previously unattainable heights and create so-called femtosecond lasers, that is, lasers with a pulse duration of about 10 to the power of minus 15 seconds, capable of doing what was previously thought impossible. First and foremost, such lasers have become, as originally planned, super powerful scientific instruments. For example, in the field of high energy physics, for instance, with their help, it became possible to initiate nuclear reactions, which has already been successfully done at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in the USA. Laser nuclear reactors are unlikely to be suitable for generating energy for commercial purposes due to the low efficiency of lasers. However, they have several possible alternative applications, for example, in nuclear engines for spacecrafts. But femtosecond lasers have found the widest application in microbiology and medicine as laser scalpels, especially in conjunction with optical tweezer technology. The point is that an ultra-short, powerful pulse can deliver a large amount of energy concentrated not only into a specific cell, but into a specific part of the cell, for example, by making a small hole in its cell wall. Thanks to this, scientists have learned to do things literally on the verge of fantasy. For example, extracting organelles from one cell and transplanting them into another. Or creating hybrid cells, essentially stitching together two cells into one. Or, for example, performing real surgical operations on embryos at early stages of development. Laser tweezers have truly opened up new horizons in biochemistry. In particular, taking the study of the most important molecule in the body, DNA, to a fundamentally new level. However, someone more knowledgeable in biology, especially microbiology and biochemistry, will probably tell you more competently about this. As for us, we can once again admire the elegance of scientific discoveries that underlie optical tweezer technology and femtosecond lasers, as well as other achievements of modern science which we have repeatedly talked about and will talk about in videos on our channel. Well, for now, goodbye, and until we meet again.